Step one, draw a circle. Step two, draw a circle. Step three, draw the rest of the furry. It's that easy. Hopefully you've been training that arm and brain connection and playing with those shapes since the last video. Today, we're going to work on creating the illusion of dimension. If you want to skip ahead to the tutorial and exercise, there's a timestamp in the description below. But if you want to know what I'm actually talking about in the exercise, then let me explain it a little bit first. But what does dimension have to do with furries? When do we get to the furries? Javago, this is video three and we haven't drawn a single tobin yet. I know, I know, I know. We're getting there and we're even gonna touch on it today. We're just gonna work on a few basics that are gonna help you not only draw furries, but anything else. I wanna get you guys started off right. The sky's the limit, but we're gonna have a hard time getting there if your ladder keeps falling down. So let's work on that foundation first, okay? Patience, young Padawan, patience. Okay, so let's talk about dimension. Learning how to portray dimension is a vital part of improving your artistic flexibility. It's what helps your viewer perceive your flat drawing as looking three-dimensional. But I wanna draw Toonie furries, like that Cocoa Puffs guy. Even Toonie artwork is gonna benefit from these principles. You need to know the rules and the perceived boundaries before you can break them. It's like a professional gaming speedrunner playing your favorite game, jumping around, doing a bunch of flippity doos and crazy stuff that you didn't even realize was possible when you played the same game. Same idea. So how do we create a sense of dimension? There's two things that you gotta practice, and that's form and tone. These two areas of practice combined are gonna add a lot to your artwork, no matter what level you're at. So how do they relate to drawing furries? Having proper form and tone can be the difference between someone thinking you drew a wolf versus a fox versus a labradoodle. You want them to be able to tell the difference, right? All right, just a quick side tangent. Fair warning, like some people just legitimately don't know the difference and are gonna confuse your animals anyways. There are people on this green earth that just don't know, so don't use that as a measuring point for your skill. Just study hard, use your reference photos, do your best and keep at it. For your own growth and sanity, be realistic when you get those kinds of comments. It's up to you to decide whether their misidentification is because of your execution or because of their lack of understanding. Some of them just know, just no matter how well you do, they just still get it wrong. S M A R K Dolphin. Wow, that says dolphin. It's it's just how it is. So let's talk about form. Form is the outline or silhouette of an object. It's kind of like the first indicator to the brain of what the object is, and then it starts decoding to figure out what the heck it's looking at. Getting this shaping right is the first step in creating a recognizable subject. And so the easiest way to do this is to build it out of basic shapes. This part takes a bit of practice. Uh, so if you haven't yet, check out my last video where I go over some basic shape exercises. Those exercises will help you to build out the forms so that you can come back to this video and we can start applying those concepts to more complex shapes. So the next part is tone and tone is well, it's, it's basically the colors used in a drawing, but not exactly the coloring per se. Tone is basically shading. It's how your eye perceives a color to change in the lighting situation that it's in. So think of it this way. You can add tone to a drawing without adding color. You can also add tone to a drawing with color. A great example of this that you've probably heard of is Banksy. Banksy doesn't always have this solid line art showcasing the outlining shape of the subject. And you can kind of understand the shape of the subject, whether the color is added or not. You can add tone by adding shading, and you can also do it by having stylized line art. It's just a matter of experimentation. So now you know a little bit more about what form and tone actually is, and practicing them together is gonna really help your artwork come to life. The human eye is looking for patterns that it already understands from its experience in real life, and what you're trying to do is hack your way into making the eye believe what it sees. There's no real quick tips for either of these things other than practice and time, but here's a double exercise that can help you with both, and you can use it as an excuse to draw a couple furries while you're at it. This first exercise is a practice in form, so let's start with a very, very simple shape. Good old blocky. 
Hello, Blocky. Right now we're looking at Blocky head on, so this isn't really a good angle for showcasing depth. If we drew this from this angle, the form would look like kind of like an H, and we would need to use tone to imply the shadows in order for the eye to see this as 3D. Right now we're focusing on form, so we want to focus on the actual lines. So let's just like turn him at a little bit of an angle so that we can get that effect using lines only. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's perfect. Perfect! So when we're trying to establish depth, we need to showcase what's kind of behind what we initially see. When we first saw Blocky, it was the front, and he looked pretty flat. But now that he's turned, his front shape has been warped. So we know it's still a square, but how do we show our viewer that this is a cube and not just some war random warped diamond? We're going to do that by filling in the sides. A very simple method of turning this weird warped diamond into an actual cube is just draw a line from three of the points on the square. It can be any three points as long as they all extend out the same way. Connect them to make the back of the box and oh my god, it's so real! Great! So now what? How do you translate this into more complex shapes? Well, that's easy. You trace! Okay, wait, 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 I know what you're thinking, but there is a right way to trace and there's a wrong way to trace. Since we are actively working to study a shape, tracing is probably one of the most effective ways to mentally process what you see and practice seeing them on other things. The key word being practice. Tracing is just going to be training wheels, okay? So depending on what medium you're using, it might affect how you're going to do this exercise. If you're exploring digital artwork, then it's going to be a lot easier for you to either take your own photos with your phone or grab some images off the internet, throw them into your canvas, and use them as tracing references. But not everybody has an iPad, so if you're using more traditional mediums like good old pencil and paper, there's a few different things you can try. You can either one, do your best to just eyeball it and replicate what you see. Two, pick up some vellum paper. It's translucent and there's a link in the description for a pack that's only a few dollars. Or three, you can print some references out on paper or tear some out of a magazine or newspaper and try tracing them using a light box or a window. Magazines or newspapers might have some printing on the back, so just do your best if that's the method you end up going with. Honestly, having a home printer is best. If you don't have one, I really recommend picking one up as it can be a really valuable art tool in cases like this and it's just something that's handy to have in general. I dropped a link to a few cheap ones in the description that'll definitely get the job done. Now that you know what you're tracing, let's try this tracing method out on a few more complex objects. If you're drawing furries, you're probably going to want to draw a dog or a cat at some point. I could be wrong, just going out on a limb here. You can draw some generic shapes to get a generic look, but if you really want to identify your subject, pick a specific species or breed. Google American Staffordshire Terrier instead of dog, or look for Japanese Bobtail instead of just cat. Seek out Mongolian Wolf instead of just wolf. They're all different and they're all going to have different shapes. Which species and breed should you pick? Well, I mean, that's, that's up to you, man. Over time, you should be constantly referencing photos, and as you do, your animal shape vocabulary is just going to grow over time. Just learn about animals. Just learn about all of them. Find the ones you like. All the cutest ones, happiest ones. The ones that make you want to draw are the best ones. Go for it, my friend. There's not really a shortcut to this process, and nothing's going to make it go any more quickly than just digging into your sketchbook and having at it. So what you're doing when you do this exercise is you're identifying the different shapes that make up the creature. As you do it more, you're going to start noticing that some of those building blocks are kind of similar in certain situations and it's going to be easier and easier to see them. It's going to become more of a mental process that you don't need to put on paper as much and this is where that training your brain thing kicks in. Once you're at that level, you can choose what you want for your style and you can decide whether or not your style even requires you to have that exact level of shaping or not because your brain is already going to be trained to be able to see it. So here's what you need to do for this exercise. I want you to fill an entire page or canvas, what have you, with animal heads that you've traced like this. Give me at least four. I want at least four. More is better, but give me at least four. Draw the same head, draw different heads, draw random objects, just pick something and go. Are you going? You can pause the video and, and go, just go. You, you, you can start back in a minute. Come back, 
Come back later. All right, I asked you to make a whole page of heads, right? You got your heads. All right, if you've been practicing shading at all, you'll know that light can't penetrate certain things. Some it can, but it usually doesn't really go through dog heads very easily. So here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna draw your light source. It doesn't, you're not doing anything fancy, just draw a circle. That is your symbol. That's your reminder to yourself that that's your light source. Put it right smack dab in the middle of all your studies. Not, not on the head, just like off to the side or something. Next, on a new layer, or very lightly if you're using paper, draw some straight lines coming directly out of the light source. Let's pretend that this is an omnidirectional light source like the sun. We'll discuss light sources more in another video, but now you know a new big word. Omnidirectional. That one's worth at least 25 cents. It means that the light is coming out in all directions. Like, you know, the sun. So this light is going to continue spreading outwards for all eternity until something gets in the way. Now, you're gonna add some tone using the same color you drew these studies with. You can start coloring those shadows solidly. You can start by drawing lines. You can start by drawing squiggles. What you're trying to do is add an amount of color that implies shape to this object. Lighter colors are gonna give the impression of softer depth as if a tiny bit of light is just glowing around the edge and highlighting it just a little bit, while darker colors are gonna really, really make it look like there's a lot of distance between your light source and the shadowy area over there where the hyenas live. Just experiment and uh, see what you end up with. All right, guys, these exercises will give you back what you put into them. So the more you do them, the more things are gonna click. As you do them, you're gonna have little eureka moments. That is how you improve. Do these exercises over and over again, and you're gonna begin noticing patterns in different types of subjects. Give them a shot, let me know what you think in the comments, and let me know if you've had any eureka moments, guys. Okay, remember to eat right, sleep tight, uh, eight hours of sleep a night, whatever the heck I said. It's all good advice, please take it. All right, I'll talk to you later, guys. Bye!